Okay, what's going on everybody? My name is Mang. Welcome back to Roll Manging for our Call of Cthulhu Horror on the Orient Express campaign. So, it's uh, it's kind of late. We ran like a half an hour or so uh, later than normal. So, I'm going to try to speed up this whole video a little bit. I'll get the facts out there. I'll try not to uh, go off topic and rant for an hour. Uh, so the last session was very crazy, very hectic. I was hoping they would chill down quite a bit this time, and they did, so it was good. It was a very productive uh, session. So, uh, okay, uh, Luton Templar was not with us uh, this session. We missed his uh, dry wit and expertise, I guess. Okay, so we started with, uh, oh, God. <laughs> Allie was at uh, the hotel, I think. Uh, Britchard and Killian were off in some Turkish motel after going to the black market. And uh, so they were all stocked up. And then Dingleberry was in the catacombs when he got knocked out by something. And then he woke up in a hospital or in a doctor's office, whatever. The doctor explained to Dingleberry that uh, the tour guide had heard some howling noises. And uh, he found him in a knocked unconscious in kind of a side uh, tunnel. And so he brought him uh, to us for assistance. Said, you know, basically the doctor thought Dingleberry was a moron and told him not to go wandering off. But he should be okay. Dingleberry goes back to the hotel. Bumps into Allie. They talk. Allie is on her way to see Remy at the Sorbonne. And uh, Remy is, of course, very pleased to see her. And uh, they, she wants to do some more research. It's a Sunday, but, you know, for a, a pretty English woman, Remy will do things anytime, any day. So they head to the, uh, on Remy's uh, suggestion, actually, they go to the Bibliothèque de l'Arsenal. Uh, which has a lot of uh, 18th century records uh, related to the Bastille and all that kind of stuff. And so there they do some research, and they discover this uh, journal entry, something like that, from the uh, the captain of the guard or something like that, who led a raid on Count Fenelik's uh, villa in Poissy, which is a, a, a small town... Uh, it's about 17 miles west of Paris. And so now they have another lead, uh, potentially. The old uh, the old villa of the Count, which was burned down that night of the raid. But maybe there's something still there. Uh, so the problem is only really Allie knows about this. Because uh, nobody tells Dingleberry anything. And the other two are wanted criminals. Okay, so... Um, let's see. I didn't take any notes this whole session, so I'm just trying to do this from memory. Again, I'll just try to get the big points out. Uh, Killian and Richard decide to investigate this whole, uh, combusting man thing. So they head out to Saint-Germain, which is the, the village where this occurred, and, uh... After dealing with some French pricks, they eventually find uh, the, the home that this occurred in. And uh, they speak with the landlady there, who is uh, who's English. Because uh, at this point, when you, when you have no... When you have nobody in the group that speaks French... It gets t I, I can't just be like, they all speak French, they all just ignore you, and uh, too bad. Yeah, I, I, I can't do that. So there has to be English people or French people that speak English. So they, they, they talk to uh, the landlady, who is charging money to people to see this death room. She only accepts francs, because they have no use for uh, pounds out here in the in a French village. Um, and so uh, Killian ends up pawning off his uh, watch, his pocket watch. Okay, so they go up, 
they get the story from her what happened, which is just, you know, she he came home with a train set. He's very excited about train sets, you know, a man of his age. And he was up there, and she heard him cry out, and there was a rumbling. And when she got up there, the room was full of smoke, and he was gone. So they go into the death room, and uh, they notice some odd things. The room uh, the room by itself is very just basic bed-sitting room that some guy just sits in and throws his life away in. Um... Just, you know, it's the kind of room like in The Punisher where you just sit there with a bottle of alcohol and a pistol in your hand. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and so the interesting thing was the top of some items bear a thin layer of black suit. There are dark sooty streaks across the ceiling in a pattern from northwest to southeast. And uh, there are bubbles under the wallpaper as though it had been steamed. And they found long black parallel smudges on the dark floral carpet, also running northwest to southeast. And, a success, uh, and uh, they noted that uh, these marks were about the width of train tracks apart. It's all kind of weird stuff. And so they noted all this, and they gathered uh, some suit in a jar. For, uh, for collection, and um, I think uh, Richard wanted to, like, examine the suit and see if there was anything odd about it, you know. And so he rolled a chemistry. He rolled a three. And he spent two luck points to turn it into a one. So, that's ridiculous. And it's just like... <laughs> Like, what am I going to tell? Occasionally, you know, the book will describe such thing, you know, if they roll chemistry or if they roll astronomy or something. But when they don't, and it's just like somebody rolls a crit, it's like, what do you tell them? Um, so I try I try to conceive some possible hints occasionally. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it's a, a miss. Here I was just like, I don't know. Um, so I, I told them that, like, the, <laughs> this suit, uh, you know, you have just this random flash of memory comes from like a coal fire and uh i was like this type of coal has not been used in trains since like you know the 19 the 19 you know early 1900s very early 1900s late 18th century i don't know 19th century whatever it is that's probably complete bullshit as far as i know there's one type of coal and it's called coal but anyways, I probably could have come up with a better lie or something. But it's like suit. And he like put it to his tongue. And he's like, oh, you know, it's like, I don't know. <laughs> anyways, moving on. So they, they say goodbye to the landlady. And uh, she tells them about the only thing that they the police really took was the train set. Because it was the only electrical item that, you know, could possibly have caused something. So they took the train set that he, he had bought. So they go to the local police, who, of course, the guy there spoke English and told them everything. Uh, it was very uh, accommodating. And he said that the, the they inspected the train set. They didn't find anything odd at all. But they passed it down for expert examination to Mr. Arthur Butters of the Paris Train Spotters Association. And uh, so they got the address for him, his house in Paris, and uh, they went on their way. They went back to Paris. They paid a visit to Mr. Butters, who was a great guy, really good guy, Mr. Arthur Butters. He's kind of like the Kensington of this campaign, except he doesn't have nearly any connections at all. But he's a good guy. So they discussed with him for a while, who, and he really cares about trains, loves trains. Uh, you have to be. And uh, eventually he lets them see the, uh, the train set, which is large. It's mounted to a, a board, so it's not like they, you can put it into a box or something. It's like a big board. It's always set up because it's mounted. And um, basically on the underside of the, some of the, all, well, all the cars actually, they found um, markings, like symbols, scratched into the undercarriages. Arcane occult symbols, perhaps. And so they uh, they fired up the train set and let it run a couple times, and then they shut it off. And uh, they were like, well, let's show these symbols to Mr. Butters. And so they had a discussion with him about uh, these symbols, and they're like, it's arcane, it must be part of some ritual, perhaps. 
did this ritual do something to, to Henry? You know, should, you know, so why would, and then uh, Arthur explained kind of the history or, you know, why this train set is um, in poor taste. It's based on, it's directly modeled after a real train from 1897 that was um, part of a crash, part of a wreckage. And a lot of people went dead or missing. And uh, what was really strange about it, and what some people think was supernatural, was that the, the the engine, the tender, and a couple of the front carriages were never found. You know, everything else was completely wrecked and you know done, but that stuff was never found. And so some people say it was supernatural. So it's in kind of poor taste to model a, a, a train directly at, off of that one, but you know, so on and so forth. And so, you know, he said, you know, it would it be possible to recreate the ritual of whatever happened to, you know, Henry? And they said that they didn't really want to, because if it just combusted him, they don't want to do that. So uh, they'll perhaps ponder and do some research, stuff like that. And so he bid them a good night and on they went. Okay. Let me think. Uh, right, so Allie and, uh, Dingleberry got together, and they called up the, um, the attendant, the nurse at the asylum, the Mr. Paul Mandarin, who was mentioned in the former director's notes, and, uh, it was splitting headache all of a sudden, I'll get through it, I will. We're like five minutes in. No, we're like 12 minutes in. Anyways. <laughs> so they talked to this guy who's, uh, who's very kind of meek and he just wants a different job. He hates it there, so on and so forth. But uh, he talks to them about um, how he he had found uh, Guimart and injured from a patient, but he doesn't know who the patient was or what happened. Uh, but now the guy is, the Guimart guy is basically insane, so he's an inmate of the asylum now. And then uh, they talked about uh, the former director of the place and how he died apparently from a fault in the electroshock machine. Um, he had been working on a new patient, but um, he doesn't know what happened because uh, the new director kind of uh, didn't. He didn't sweep it under the rug, but he kind of just moved that along quickly. He didn't want that to be a whole scandal or something. They, I think they interpreted it as the electroshock machine was being used on the former doctor. But, no, the, he was using it on the patient. And Mandarin suspected that there was some fault with the machine that, you know, affected the doctor who was using it on the... Uh, anyways. So they thanked him for his time, and they, on they went. Okay, so next day happened. And uh, they were all planning to meet up with uh, Remy. They all wanted to meet up with Remy because he was like their connection to get the group back together. And so, I don't know how the other two heard about the Bibliothèque de l'Arsenal. I don't remember exactly, but they they went there. They were heading there, and then. Uh, the other two, Al Allie and Dingleberry, went to Sorbonne and went, went to the Sorbonne to, to meet with Remy, but they just found his colleagues there who told them that Remy was part of the protest in front of the uh, where else the Bibliothèque de l'Arsenal. So they all went down there. They all converged on this protest group, and there were a bunch of constables there with rifles. And uh, so they met all with Remy right in the middle of this protesting group. And they're like, oh, it's you, and it's you, and it's you, and it's, oh, Remy. And like, oh, and then Remy's just like, oh, yeah, he's shouting in French and bullshit like that. And so they're about to, like, give up on him and leave when, of course, you know, violence breaks out as it tends to happen in uh, Call of Cthulhu campaigns. And uh, so shots are fired. The group scatters. Everybody scatters. Uh, Britchard rolls, like, 100 on his uh, dodge. So he takes a shot right in the, right in the shoulder area. And, of course, Remy gets shot, because that's how it works. So he goes tumbling down. He got shot straight through the chest. He's, like, bleeding a little bit. 
But uh, Allie is holding him in, in her arms, and he's like, "At least I can die with a woman in my, you know, in a woman's arms." And uh, he says, "My one regret is that I never kissed you." And so <laughs> there's like a five minute thing there where she really debated about whether she wanted to kiss this guy. And she's trying to be like a nurse, you know, she's trying to actually save this guy's life. But there's a part of Remy that would rather kiss her and die than not kiss her and live. Um, so finally she decides she's not going to kiss him. And so he's just like, he, you know, there's like a forlorn look in his eye, the tears about to come out, and he just says, Viva la France. And he, he collapses. And so she can save his life. He's not dead. She can save him, but he has to get a ten, you know, he has to get medical help immediately. So the group gets together. Dingleberry basically <laughs> uh, stops an old woman driving a car in the street and uh, yells at her that they need to get to the hospital. And fortunately for Dingleberry, in this situation, the word for hospital in French, I believe, is uh, apital. So it's pretty similar. I let it go. And he's like, oh, l'hôpital, uh, allez, allez, you know. So <laughs> they all clambered in. Even the, like there was five people or whatever in this in this car with this old lady. And she just guns it to this hospital. You know, she probably endangers many lives along the way. But damn it, do they get there to save Remy's life. So they get there. Remy goes in. He's going to live. Uh, Britchard goes in there. He gets his shoulder treated and so on and so forth. And they all get together and they talk about the situation. And, you know, there, there's tensions. Tensions are high between this group. Uh, higher than I think I've ever seen in a Call of Cthulhu campaign. Um, all because of, uh, because of Allie, pretty much. Um, she sold them out, and, uh, you know, she abandoned them, and all, all that kind of stuff. There was a lot of words were said, you know. But eventually, you know, we, we come around to the, the cold hard fact. That at a certain point, you have to metagame. In character, I think Allie would call the cops, and which I think she did. I think she was trying to hint to me something. Here, I'll read. You know, She sent me private messages. She said um, that she was going to make a phone call. She goes to make a phone call specifically to get into contact with the officer that uh, talked to her in Sharrington about and who she sold the other guys out to she didn't tell me what the phone call was about i think she was hoping that i would infer what the phone call like she was selling them out again but why would she call the guy from charenton why wouldn't she just call the parisian constabulary i don't know she wasn't very clear about it so nothing really happened because again here's a cold hard fact you either tell me that as your character you would have nothing to do with this group and you just make a new character or you, I guess, leave the campaign permanently, like some people have done. <laughs> Matt. Uh, you either do that, or you accept that we're all here to just play a campaign. And so you say, screw what your character would do, and you just say, all right, let's go do stuff. I'm not lecturing her or anything like that. I'm just saying this is this is how it is. Um, because yeah, for a while, you know, that is... It, 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 it's it's an interesting, you know, there's character development. Sometimes it's funny or, you know, it's, you know, it's a different approach or something like that. But when it comes down to it, we're all here to play the campaign. And when it comes down to me, I want you all together. If you're going to, again, I'm not lecturing. It's, I, I get, I'm getting that tone, I know. But if you're going to be, if you're going to be playing a character that wants nothing to do with the group eventually i'll be like all right you either have to suck it up or make a new character it, it has you know it, we have to come down to it. i'm not gonna just gonna follow the individual adventures of this singular character you know it's a group effort that's what this is again <laughs> not lecturing <laughs> but i i think she she realized that and so it's just like all right you know we'll we'll go together we'll just forget about it just forget about it and we'll do our we'll do our we'll do our group adventures. Okay, so uh, 
they're all okay so then we came into the next problem that was one problem here's our secondary problem uh most of the group is convinced that everything comes down to the asylum it's all in the asylum the simulacrum is at the asylum everything they need is in the asylum Allie never wants to go to the asylum again, because why would she? I didn't blame her at all. She would never go back, and none of them should go back. And so yeah, this could be a part for uh, Secrets of Royal Mangan, but I feel I should discuss it here. Because it puts me in a very problematic position. Because I think I, I, I can be comfortable now talking about this, cause, since it's all kind of wrapped up. But you're, you're sometimes put into a position as a DM where you know your players are going off the rails. Where they're going down a road that's basically a dead end. There's nothing there. You're just wasting everybody's time. Now, the question that I have to ask myself then, is it a waste of time if it's fun? Them going to the asylum again and... It pro Maybe they would break in. I don't know if they would attempt that again. Or going through diplomatically. Go, breaking in would obviously be more fun. But uh, there would probably be some amount of fun either way. But I have to draw the line at some point. You know, if what, you know, if their idea of fun, and, you know, I'm sure they would have fun doing it, is just running around Grand Theft Auto style, just blowing stuff up and causing a lot of trouble and just making chaos, that could be fun for them. But if it is antithetical to the campaign itself and to the progress of the campaign, I have to draw the line at some point. Now, obviously, that's an extreme example. Here, it's just like they're just going down a dead end. And so I had that dilemma. I was like, do I just, how do I, or do I, you know, make a notion that this is not the correct path for them? Do I do that? Or do I just let them do whatever they want? discover on their own that this is a dead end and we waste we waste basically a session or half a session or whatever and so like i've said in the past this is a long campaign very long very long and so if i don't rein in the the, the group at certain points We'll never get to the end. And so, and at, at this junction, I was like, I can't let them go through all the asylum bullshit. Or, if they do, at least not right now. Now, obviously, they're never going there now. Now, now that I've said all this, they're not going to go back there. But, also, as you'll find out, they, they don't need to go there. They know that. I would hope. Um, so, I was just like, you know... I, and I brought this up, I was like, you know, and I felt like it was kind of obvious. Once The fact that I brought it up, it was like, you know, do I tell you guys something? You know, it was just like, when they're all discussing about, you know, insisting on going to the asylum. It was like, do I tell you guys something about the, you know, and then they, some of them were like, no. And they wanted maybe a clue about what to do or something. But it's like, how do I, how do I give you a clue that the asylum is not where you go? <laughs> how do I do that? It's impossible. And so I was just like, you know, somebody roll an intelligence. So they all roll intelligence. The only one I think that succeeded really was Dingleberry. Or maybe a bunch of them succeeded. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. Why did I even mention that? Anyways. And I, I told them, I was like, you realize. You realize that it's most, most likely much far easier to go to this village of Poissy and try to find his old villa and go through that route then going into the asylum again and uh Killian was like oh well you know we knew that and I was like yes yes I'm sure you did but now I am saying it and this is really really key they need, players in a campaign need to pay attention to every word that comes out of the DM's mouth. Because the DM does not say anything just for hell's sake. Occasionally, alright, that's not true. <laughs> that's a lie. Occasionally, a DM will say something just to throw you off. 
But if he does, he's throwing you off for a reason, you know. Or if it's a red herring, he's putting it in there, if he's a good DM, he's putting it in there for the betterment of the campaign in some aspect, you know. Everything the DM does and says should be for the betterment of the campaign. There are, there are multiple moment, moments in the campaign so far. And I'm not going to mention them here because, you know, they're watching this. But multiple moments where I've said phrases and words and, you know, general statements that I feel the... I think the players all heard, but they didn't give the proper amount of uh, respect to the, the weight of these statements. You know, where they're just kind of like, oh, you know, he's where it's just prose or something. I, I don't know what they interpret it as, but they don't quite fully interpret it. And I guess a good one is the conversation that they had with Arthur Butters. Again, I'm not going to give specifics. I'll save that for the secrets video. But I think they were just like having a conversation with this guy rather than having a conversation with this guy who's talking through the DM, you know. And that is meta, I know. But there is always going to be a degree of meta. You need to have a sense of meta, because if there was no meta in the campaign, they'd all be dead by now. They'd all be far dead or not interested at all. So, don't don't meta game as players, but understand the meta that is existing. I'm being very cryptic, I know. Anyways, let's move on. I don't want to rant. Where the hell was I? Oh, so yeah, at that point, they're like, okay, well, let's go to Poissy. You know, at that point, if you still go to the asylum, I you just shake your head at that. There, there's nothing I can do. All right, let's just do it. But no, they're like, let's go to Poissy. So they take a train out there, and of course, it's another stuck-up French bullshit. So none of them like Englishmen for whatever reason. Very few people speak French. And this is actually from the book. None, very few people speak French. Although, I made them assholes on purpose. Because they get there at, like, uh, no, 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 that's secret stuff. I can't talk about that. <laughs> uh, okay, let me just, let me just talk about what happened. Okay, so they get there, they go to the hotel. The hotel people are assholes. They don't want sterling. They don't want pounds. So uh, they're sitting there trying to convince these people. And, again, none of them speak English. None of the party speaks French. It's total psh, psh. These guys are assholes. Our party is mostly assholes and Dingleberry. And uh, so they're trying to communicate. So I just had like this old drunk English guy at the bar with this huge beard. And he's like, they don't want your money, English. <laughs> and so he directs them to the home of this, um, of the town doctor, who is English as well. Christian. And uh, he gives them directions. And so they go in the night to this house on top of a hill, very ominous looking, and I think, I would hope, and here's, <laughs> again, if you're a bit new to RPGs or anything like that, it's like, you're in this, you're in this town to find, like, one house, basically, or, you know, the house that this, this is built atop where this villa was, and me as a DM lead you completely away from the hotel down all the way on the other end of the village where there's a house on top of a hill. If you don't realize right then and there that this is the exact house that you're looking for, I, I can't help you then. So I, I would hope they all realize, but I still had to like talk about it in character. But anyways, so they all go up there. It's real classic house on the hill kind of stuff. It's not that big. It's kind of just this two-story little house, but, you know, it's on a hill, so it's a house on a hill, whatever, anyways, so they go up, they knock on the door, and they get introduced to Christian, Christian Lorian, who is the, he's an Englishman, he's from London originally, he's here with his wife, Veronique, who is French, and uh, their daughter, Quaterie. Christian's a good guy, they're all good people, or so it seems, you know, you never can tell. He's on the level, man. And so, uh... After a little bit of discussion, Christian lets them into his house. 
uh, gives them coffee, and they explain vaguely what they're there for. They're looking for strange curios and stuff like that. And um, they notice a scar on the back of his left hand, and um, they keep talking. And eventually, Killian decides to just kind of level with the guy and go into much more detail. Um, and he asks him if you know they've noticed anything strange or if they've you know see, found any you know artifacts or anything like that. And he says he hasn't. He goes upstairs to talk to his wife, and he comes back down with a letter. And the letter basically, well, the letter's like one of the most important pieces of evidence in the whole chapter. <laughs> like, they're not going to not find the letter. It's, it's unmissable, basically. And the letter is from a guy named Edgar Wellington, who sent it to the Lorians. And it basically says that he is, you know, doing research and looking into the Sedefkar Simulacrum. And uh, he heard that there was a, uh, a German count that lived where you live now. And he apparently had information about it. He's in possession of scrolls and stuff like that. It's the most like, we have to look into this, you know, this letter. Oh, my God. You know, it's, very, it's, it's a huge piece of evidence. It's guaranteed their next location. If they don't go anywhere but Lausanne, Switzerland, they're, again, I can't help you. And uh, so, like, oh, this is interesting. At this point, around this point, uh, the girl uh, knocks, like, Dingleberry's arm, and, uh, he spills hot coffee all over his lap, and her arm. It's not like, Scott, it's not like McDonald's hot, it's, like, uncomfortable hot. And, uh, so she starts screaming, like, her arm's been cut off, and she's like, ah, you know, it's horrible screaming. <laughs> and so Christian kind of attends to her and puts her to bed and all that kind of stuff, blah, 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 blah. And he eventually serves dinner and offers them, you know, as to stay the night. God damn it, this headache. <laughs> I'm just trying to get through this. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, and so, uh, Verani comes downstairs and they notice that her left hand is um, arthritic and gnarled and, you know, it's terrible. It's ugly. It's nasty. Uh, but they have a very nice dinner, very pleasant dinner. They don't know what it was. They had a very pleasant dinner. Uh, during, after dinner, or around the end of dinner, uh, Killian decides he wants to check out what's upstairs. There's something shady up there. So he sneaks up. Well, he says he's going to the bathroom, which is upstairs, which is very fortunate. That was based on the. They give you plans for the house in the book, so it's upstairs. So he goes up there, he goes into the bathroom, sure, and then he listens to the wall, he hears quiet snoring from presumably the daughter. He never checks. And uh, then he checks out another room, which is com a completely bare, empty room. Completely empty. Sparse. Actually, no, sparse isn't, it's empty. <laughs> That's the word. <laughs> And uh, while examining this room, he thinks he sees, like, f mist outside one of the windows. Almost, like, taking shape. But it could just be the snow. This, of course, creeps him out. Um, and as he's kind of uh, heading out of that door, the uh, there's a loud scream coming from the girl's room. And so he rushes in there. Girl sees him. She screams again. She, like, runs past him, screaming for her mom. She runs downstairs, uh, Killian shortly behind her. And uh, she starts speaking in French rapidly between sobs to her mom. And Christian says that she claims she saw a, a boogeyman outside her window. <laughs> Kids, you know. And so uh, Killian takes him to the side, to a different room. And he's like, you know... Uh, I, I'm not one to, you know, five years ago I wouldn't have believed in any of this, but, you know, so on and so forth. And But I, I think that I saw something outside the window in the bathroom as well. And so Christian kind of like, you know, he kind of like puts his head back, he stares at him a little bit, he like raises his eyebrow, and then he's like, Ah, oh, Killian, you old dog, pulling a joke on me. She's just having a bad dream. You know how kids are. 
And Killian's like, Killian starts laughing, of course, pretending it's a joke. And then uh, Christian and Barani take the, the daughter up and they're like, you know, there's some real shady shit going on around here. <laughs> they also notice that there's no religious, uh, you know, iconography or, you know, any any pieces of religious uh, bricky brack or whatever around the house. Hmm. Vampires. Um come back down they have dessert and uh they bring out the old plans for the old house i guess that they have i I don't i don't know where they got these or why they have them or anything like that but they pull out these plans of the old house and they note uh a cellar which apparently belonged to the old you know the old house and it should still be around here so they could find it in the morning so they all go to bed and uh they wake up and again, this was like, we're, we're at like 1130. We're like half an hour or like, we're like 20 minutes past where we normally end. So it's just like, all right, let's just finish this up. Because if we end here, it's really lame. We're like five minutes away. So I kind of rushed this ending here. It would have been much, much spookier. And, you know, tense if I had more time to drag it out. But I was just like, let's just get this done because it'll, it'll be cool. So they, they, you know, they walk around in the snow and actually Dingle Bear is the one that leads them to where the cellar is. They dig, like, they spend the whole day digging in the snow and the ground. They have to dig through the ground to get to where the cellar is. And they finally dig out the entire entrance to the cellar. They crowbar it open and they go into these tunnels underneath the, underneath the house. And they, they're walking through these, this basically tunnel. And it's uh, it's creepy. Like all the roots from a nearby tree have kind of intertwined into the tunnel, and they all extend out and then end in like five smaller branches, like an arm and a hand. Yeah, get it? You you will. Hold on. <laughs> and so um, they they keep going, and they go past all these kind of small small rooms branching off of the hallway, and they're all. They're basically little prison cells, but they're also torture chambers. There's like, uh, you know, there's torture devices, there's racks, there's chains, but there's also like chairs, like lounge chairs placed in front of like these torture devices. So people are watching this bullshit. There's sanity losses, all kind of stuff. Then they get to the end of the hallway and they notice in the next room out of their view side, there's like a glow coming from there. So Ziggy, of course, Richard, um, again, he, he wanted the session. He was like the only one that wanted the session to be over. He's got shit to do apparently. So he, uh, I was like, no, just five more minutes. We'll be done, man. We'll be good. So he's just like, he charges into the room, which is not something Richard would normally do. I'm sure. But again, time concerns. So he rushes in and, uh, oh shit. I'll actually read the description cause it is cool. Okay, the faint glow comes from roses of fantastic colors, aquamarine, violet, orange, and grass green. These flowers hang from thick rose vines which have an oily black sheen and drip black ichor from long thorns. The vines have grown through the remains of those who died here so that they support the bent and twisted skeletons, which are thus tormented even in death. Flowers bloom in empty sockets, and the vines have pulled the dead into strange poses. At the base of the mass lies the left arm of a statue. It is human-sized and glows faintly. Um, yeah, so they cut through all the vines after taking more sanity loss, by the way, cut through all the vines and, uh, Killian reaches for it and grabs the left arm of the Sidefkar simulacrum. The, uh, <coughs> the rose blossoms immediately begin to decay. And that's pretty much where we left off. Oh, uh, Allie didn't go down into the, um, she didn't go down into the cellar. She stayed at the entrance. And so, um, before the campaign really started, uh, her and I had, had talked a bit about how the campaign was going to be and stuff like that. And, uh, we had, we had some discussions. So the, the one thing I think that she really took from that was the, um, she wanted her character to you know, survive for as long as possible, which I think should be the goal of almost all characters unless you're Dingleberry. And so the the one thing that was brought up was like, you know, Reginald. 
or something from from the mask campaign who lived the longest of any of the characters and he lived there he lived the longest partly because partly because he was the most cautious you know I, at times i guess he he didn't like especially with like the lizard the lizard house or whatever he he didn't go in there he just sent the others and he kind of just sat behind but also mostly because he made a dark pact with Golk and you know and I, I I kept him alive on purpose for most of the time because I wanted to. And so it, it goes back to kind of the meta thing where it's like your character, if your character would not go down there and just has no interest in any of this and would just leave, you know, that, that could be what your character would do. But again, it's a meta thing where it's like you're playing a game. You know, it's like... It's like <laughs> you know, play any horror game, you know? where your 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 character in in game might never go anywhere and probably would just kill themselves at some point in some games but it's just like no you just press forward on the control stick and you keep going you know um that's kind of what it's like with call of Cthulhu. it's like at some point every character would just stop or kill themselves or whatever they would not go anywhere for there's just no there's no way but you're playing a game you want to see more of the campaign so you keep going and <laughs> not lecturing or anything but it, and that in this situation it's just like okay fine you know you didn't want to go down to the creepy cellar but if you're going to consistently not go into certain locations many locations there's going to be a lot more locations like that if you're not going to go in there um you have to kind of think and even if you don't want to think in a meta perspective you just want to think like, well, this character doesn't want to go down there. It's like, okay, does this character, why would this character keep going? You know, but also your fellow investigators are probably going to get kind of pissed at you at a certain point where it's just like, you know, why do we have you? And, uh, man, it seems like I'm being really harsh on her. I'm trying not to be, um, it's fine. It's just kind of, I'm, I'm having a discussion. All right. And so, yeah, in this situation, she prevented, you know, a bunch of sanity loss, and that was it. They didn't really need her expertise or anything like that. But this is just a very minor situation in, in, in that example. And so, that's basically where we ended. They got the first piece of the simulacrum, a certain number more to go. No, I won't say how many. Um, and, um, yeah, they have a very, very solid next lead, Lausanne in Switzerland, the French part of Switzerland. So we're still in, we're still in French land. And, um, boy, wouldn't you, hold on. Yeah, wouldn't you know that, that the, uh. The Orient Express happens to pass through Lausanne. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. But yes, very fortunate. So next time, we're finally going to get on the Orient Express. Finally, we're going to get on the actual name of the campaign, the Orient Express. It's going to be great. They're going to settle in. We're going to have some fun times. Um, I guess the only question is, for next time, is do they still look into this kind of train situation? Because it seems, I, I think even to them, it would probably seem like superfluous, unnecessary. It's like, you know, what does this have to do with the simulacrum? Um, they probably don't see a connection there. Uh, I guess the only connection they can really see is with Mehmet Makrat, who apparently sold the train set. Um, and Mehmet Makrat is, you know, as far as they can tell, their main adversary. So they might see a connection there. And they do like Arthur Butters. So maybe they'll look into it one more time, pay a visit to Arthur Butters. But either way, eventually they're going to get on the Orient Express and get on their merry way. So that'll be very interesting. And now they have a very sacred artifact with them. Will this cause them to be the target of many cultists? Probably. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I apologize for not being ver more verbose with the session, but damn <laughs> anyway it's too bright in here god damn it 
anyways, that's going to wrap it up for today. Uh, we'll discuss many more things in Secrets of Royal Manging, what they did wrong, the small things that they did right, uh, what was going on in that house, what were they doing, were they vampires? You'll have to watch that video to find out. Anyways, my name is Mang. This has been Roll Mangy. I'll see you fine folks next week.